Om. The wound still burned for a long time. Siddhartha had to ferry many travelers across the river, some with a son or daughter, and he couldn't see any of them without envy, without thinking, so many people, so many thousands have this most wonderful happiness. Why not me? Even bad people, thieves and robbers have children. Love them, are loved by them, but not me. He thought so simply and irrationally now, having become much like the childlike people. He now saw people differently than before, less cleverly, less proudly, but more warmly, more curiously and with more involvement. When he ferried ordinary travelers, childlike people, merchants, warriors or women, these people didn't appear foreign to him as they once had. He understood them, he understood and shared not their thoughts and insights, but their lives guided solely by drives and desires. He felt akin to them, although he was close to self-realization and still bore his final wound, it seemed to him that these childlike people were his brothers and their vanities, desires and follies lost their ridiculousness for him, became understandable, became lovable, even worthy of reverence. A mother's blind love for her child, the silly blind pride of a consighted father for his only little son, the blind wild pursuit of jewelry and admiring men's eyes by a young vain woman. All these drives, all these childish things, all these simple, foolish yet immensely strong, strongly living, strongly assertive drives and desires were no longer childish things to Siddhartha. He saw that people lived for them, saw them achieve endless things for their sake, travel, wage wars, endure endless suffering and endure endlessly, and he could love them for it. He saw life, the living, the indestructible, the Brahman in each of their passions, each of their deeds. These people were lovable and admirable in their blind loyalty, their blind strength and courage. They lacked nothing, the wise and thinkers had nothing ahead of them, except one little thing. The awareness, the conscious thought of the unity of all life. And Siddhartha sometimes doubted whether this knowledge, this thought was really worth so much whether it might also be a childish thing for the thinking people, the thinking childlike people. In all other respects, the worldly people were equal to the wise, often far superior to them. Just as animals in their tough, unwavering pursuit of the necessary can sometimes seem superior to humans. Slowly the realization, the knowledge of what true wisdom was, the goal, of his long search blossomed and ripened in Siddhartha. It was nothing but a willingness of the soul, an ability, a secret art to think the thought of unity at any moment, in the midst of life to feel and breathe in unity. Slowly this blossomed within him, radiated back to him from Vasudeva's old childlike face, harmony, knowledge of the eternal perfection of the world, a smile, unity. Yet the wound still burned. Siddhartha thought longingly and bitterly of his son, nurtured his love and tenderness in his heart, let the pain eat away at him, committed all the follies of love. This flame didn't extinguish on its own. And one day when the wound burned fiercely, Siddhartha crossed the river, driven by longing, 
disembarkment and intended to walk to the city to look for his son. The river flowed gently and quietly. It was the dry season, but its voice sounded strange. It laughed. It laughed clearly. The river laughed brightly and clearly at the old ferryman. Siddhartha stopped, bent over the water to listen better. And in the gently flowing water he saw his face reflected. And in that reflected face he saw something that reminded him of something he had forgotten. As he pondered, he found it. This face resembled another, one he had once known, loved and feared. It resembled the face of his father, the Brahmin. And he remembered how he as a young man had forced his father to let him join the ascetics, how he had said goodbye to him, how he had left and never returned. Hadn't his father suffered the same pain for him that he now suffered for his son? Hadn't his father died long ago, alone, without ever having seen his son again? Should he not expect the same fate for himself? Wasn't it a comedy, a strange and silly thing, this repetition, this running in fateful circle? Yes, it was true. Everything that wasn't fully suffered and resolved came back. The same sufferings were endured again and again. But Siddhartha climbed back into the boat and returned to the hut, remembering his father and his son, laughed at the river, at odds with himself inclined to despair and no less inclined to laugh aloud at himself and the whole world. Ah, the wound still hadn't blossomed. His heart still resisted fate. Cheerfulness and victory hadn't yet shone from his pain. Yet he felt hope. And when he returned to the hut, he felt an irresistible desire to open up to Vasudeva, to show him everything, to tell him everything, to the master of listening. Thanks for listening. Please leave a comment with your thoughts. This new translation of Hermann Hesse's Siddhartha is also available as a book and ebook on Amazon.